Hi guys. So let us now um, take a look at the on how we can create a step-by-step -step process of elaborating the analysis classes that we had been um, previously generated. And also I repeat, um, this elaboration is the core of our um, component level design. Okay, so let's get started. First step. We need to identify all the classes or all the um, analysis classes that corresponds to the um, to the problem domain. So again, uh, these are all the analysis classes you have identified previously, as they correspond to our problem domain. Okay, so I know that I already um, presented previously, and also. Uh, to take note, I want you to take note that we need to review the analysis classes um, that we already um, that we already identify because those classes or the analysis classes are mostly based on the problem domain and are mostly classified as entity classes. Okay, so if we will check in this figure or in this example. Um, uh, we can see in this example that from the architectural design, which is this one, okay, which is, oh, sorry. Oh, God. One moment. Eraser. One moment. Okay. There you go. Okay. Good job. Okay. So, again, um, if we see in this example um, from the architectural design, from this architectural design, sorry, from this architectural design, the corresponding analysis class is elaborated to contain the detailed information about the data and its operations. So here in this architectural design, uh, we, uh, we actually elaborated the compute page cost module. Right. If you can see it here, this is actually our um, design or elaborated design. Okay. Step number two. Uh, we need to identify as well all the design classes that correspond to the infrastructure domain. Okay. So this time, uh, I know that um, some uh, since. I keep on repeating, I, I keep on emphasizing that uh, we are doing an iterative process or an iterative approach. That's why I keep on letting you change your previous diagrams, right? Also here in step number two, I just like to emphasize that if ever that there are some, um, um, there are some classes or there are some control classes that are not yet being seen or not yet being identified we will now identify it here okay so again the control or sorry the control and our interface classes are often not seen in the architectural model but in here we will now identify those okay so for example um classes that will check the valid the validity of um, data before saving it to the database okay um, if ever that you did not um, if ever that um, you did not see that class before you can just uh, you can just include that one here okay let's create another class that um, establishes um, connection to the server and also a class that records logs of the activities okay so these are the sample, um, the examples. For example, for the GUI um, components, al also for the operating system components, and also the data management components. Um, the data management components earlier that uh, that actually I discuss, uh, we can create a class name connection. Okay, forgive me with my penmanship okay connection class for example this is a connection class so you will 
uh, you just now identify the connection class okay so basically again the purpose of the connection class this will record the log history of all the users okay so if we will base it uh, to your previous project um, I'm sorry if we will base this one to the approved project um, this class will get the system clock or for example if it's in the computer clock or if it's in the online base clock okay um, operating system for the server we can also put a class for that one okay again these are all classes that are not yet identified in our um, infrastructure domain and we will identify it here or uh, sorry uh, it's not yet being identified in the architectural mo model so we will uh, we will identify all it here in our infrastructure domain okay proceed so um, exam uh, sorry step number three so we will now elaborate all the design classes that are not uh, that are not acquired as reusable components so generally um, elaboration requires uh, uh, requires that all interfaces um, attributes and operations necessary to implement the class be described in detail so again by the word itself elaborate so we need to make sure that uh, we are describing each component or we are describing for example um, the um, the operations or our classes in detail okay so if you are working in a non-object oriented environment the first three um, three steps focus on the refinement of data objects and processing functions like um, transforms or transforms functions identified as part of the analysis model so these are the things to consider during the elaboration but for this one we have the cohesion we have the coupling and i will discuss that one in the next topic or in our next slide so now um, if you will be working on an object-oriented environment you might need to follow the succeeding steps so let's proceed to 3a so step 3a we need to identify um oh, sorry we need to specify the message details when classes or components collaborate so a collaboration diagram by the way it's used here a collaboration diagram it's used um, to show how analysis classes collaborate with one another Essentially, this is what the sequence diagram also um, diagrams also do, or sequence diagram also does, right? Just um, just so you know, um, you can alternatively use collaboration diagrams instead. Um, what we are trying to emphasize in the collaboration diagram is that um, the message passing activity between the components okay so based on this um, the um, collaboration diagram if you can check here on our screen um, we use the um, production job uh, we also use the work order job I'm uh, sorry work order in the job queue components okay to write them uh, we can actually use the object constraint language or the OCL syntax so that we have a standard in passing messages from one component to another um, based on this one I did not include yet the example of an OCL syntax it's actually in the next slide um, here I'll just need to explain first uh, the diagram or the collaboration diagram first uh we have our guard condition so for our guard condition basically for our guard condition uh, this actually specifies any set of conditions that must be met before the message can be sent so basically from the production job um, from the production job object sorry i'm not talking about the class 
um, the produ uh, production job object um, to the um, job queue object. So there should be um, there should be a uh, mess. Uh, sorry, um, there uh, there should be a condition. There should be a set of condition that must be met before the message will be sent to the job queue. So based on this example, um, if ever that um, there is a guard condition here, if ever that that guard condition satisfied, uh, it the message which is the sub submit job will be transferred to the um, it will be passed through the uh, it will be transferred to the job queue object. Okay. So again, this is the OCL syntax. Okay, sorry. Guard condition, sequence expression. We also have the return value if it's necessary, the message name, and also the which is that includes um, the argument list. Already done discussing about the guard condition. Let's proceed to the sequence expression. So for the sequence expression, it is actually a in, uh, integer value. Okay or other ordering indicator, for example, one, two, three. So base it here in our example, we started from one, then number two, like that one. Okay, again, this is sequential. Okay, this actually indicates the sequential order in which a message should be sent. So the message build job here and also the message submit job, okay? Number three, we have the message name. For the message name, this is actually, uh, this corresponds to the operation that is to be invoked, okay? Again, this is the operation, uh, this actually corresponds to the operations that needs to be invoked. Next, we have the argument list. Argument list is a list of attributes that are passed, uh, that is uh, that are passed um, to the operation. So this is actually the message. Okay, I will give you an example of the argument list in the next succeeding slides. Okay, we also have the return value here. I forgot to include as well the return value here, uh, the definition. But again. Uh, if we will talk about the return value, this is actually the name of the un uh, of the information that is returned by the operation invoked by the message. I know that you've been using return value or returned in your um, previous course or in your in your programming course. Let's proceed. Step three B. So. Uh, we need to identify now the appropriate interfaces for each component. So basically, we are now um, identifying the interfaces. Okay. So in this example, if you can notice here, uh, we elaborated the print job, right? Um, print job class to include two interfaces, which is our compute job interface and the initiate job interface. Um, these classes or interface classes will serve as interaction points between the users or the other classes, okay? So if we will recall that one in your object-oriented um, programming course, uh, we want to design classes at some level of abstraction. This means that we need to, or it's not necessarily that we need to, uh, no, yeah, actually we need to hide um, certain details about the class and expose only certain essential information to the users, okay? Not, um, not all should be exposed to the users, okay? Interfaces is one way of doing that. Um, interfaces is one way of doing that, okay? So with interfaces, we declare a set of coherent public operations that are realized by the class that implements it. Okay? Again, if we will talk about interface, it is actually a group of external, uh, visible or externally visible 
for public operations. The interface contains no internal structure. It has no attributes, no associations. Every operation in the interface within the abstraction class should be cohesive. Okay, again, we need to be uh, cohesive. Um, that is, it should exhibit processing that focuses on one limited function or subfunction. So if you can see it here in our print job class, um, we have the compute job interface here. If you can see it here in the compute job interface, we actually defined or uh, we actually created another four operations inside the print compute job. Also the same as the initiate job, we have three operations created here. So as a form of elaboration, we can take a look at this inter initiate job. The initiate job um, um, object actually does not exhibit a sufficient cohesion. Okay, so again, if we will talk about cohesion, um, it should only focus on one function. Um, base here, it contains a lot. So it's not, uh, it doesn't um, exhibit a cohesion. So please take note on that one. Okay. Um, actually, um, um, it performs three different sub-functions. So um, building a work order, we also... Um, if we will talk about the production job, uh, production job, I, sorry, if we will talk about the print job um, class earlier, uh, we can, uh, we sh it should perform um, three different sub-functions. First, it should build a work order. Next, um, it should check a job priority. And lastly, it should pass a job to production. Okay. The interface design should be refactored, okay? So one approach might, might be to re-examine the design classes and define a new class, which is what we call the work order. The work order has its own build work order, okay? So um, the operation build uh, work order becomes the part of that class which is the work order right similarly we might define a class job queue that would incorporate the operation check priority okay operation check priority for our job queue class okay a class production job um, would encompass all the information associated with uh, with a production job to be passed to the production facility. Unfortunately, I did not include a an operation here, but basically, I need uh, basically here there should be a uh, a an operation. So, for example, a prod operation. The purpose of this one is to uh, the purpose of this one is to pass um, the production job to the uh, the production job to the production facility. Okay, this is the work. Uh, that is the uh, purpose of the operation. Uh, operation prod. Okay, next the we also have the interface initiate job. So this is our interface initiate job. So then um, take the form shown in this figure so if you can see it here the pass job to production right the interface initiate job is now cohesive focusing on one function only if we will go back to the previous slide it compasses three right so if we will be uh, if we uh we need to be cohesive that's why we need to make sure that in our initiate job, there should be one function that actually uses other functions, okay? And as well, the interfaces associated, uh, the interfaces should be associated with the 
production job, the work order class, and the job queue class. Okay? And also, take note that if you will be using cohesive or cohesion, um, this is actually similar to a single-minded approach, uh, meaning uh, they work as one functionality or one logic only. Okay? So from this type of uh, from this uh, from this class uh, from this class going to this one if we will use a cohesive type of approach okay next step we need to elaborate the attributes and define the data types and data structures required to implement them so take note um during the first component level design iteration Attributes are normally described by names here. Oh, it's already been described here, right? Since we are done elaborating the interfaces, okay, we're done in elaborating those interfaces. Okay, this time uh, we will elaborate the data types and data structures. Okay, so you will notice that in our uh, attributes here. In the analysis class, we only name them names. Also here, it's only names, right? In this this time, we would like uh, we will uh, we will actually elaborate um, those attributes, and I will explain that one in our succeeding slides. Okay, so in further iterations, by the way, guys. We also elaborate this particular detail. So in UML, um, it defines an attribute data type using the following syntax. So we have the name. We have, of course, we, this is the name of our attribute, the type expression, the initial value, which uh, the, um, the value, the first value that, what, that actually instantiated okay and also the property okay so if we will check the example here um, we got this attribute paper type here okay paper type here so the paper type is our name um, the paper type weight is our name sorry uh, the string is our um, type expression then the initial value it's a that has choices that contains actually one of the four values so it's actually a selection of a b c and d okay so in general um data structures and types used to define attributes are defined within the context of the programming language that is to be used for the implementation part Okay, so by the way, um, it might need or your team needs to um, identify um, the programming language to be used so that you can use the correct data type like the, for example, if you will use var, var car or a car, right, and everything. So this time it's better to, um, to identify the um, I, I believe that you already identified your programming um, language to use. But here, you need to um, put in detail um, the, um, the data type um, by putting, for example, um, var or by putting var car, like that one. Also, class, take note. Um, if an attribute appears repeatedly across a number of design classes, and it has a relatively complex structure, it is best to create a separate class to accommodate the attribute. Okay? So again, in step 3C, we are actually elaborating the attributes in our, um, in our, in our class. Okay? C. Last part for, um, of the step 3, uh, is we need to define, uh, sorry, 
we need to describe the processing flow of each operation in detail. So as a recap, uh, we, are, uh, we are done elaborating the interfaces. So we're done in, uh, elaborating the interfaces of that one. Okay. Also, we're done elaborating the attributes. Here are the attributes. Okay. This time, we will elaborate the operations. It's here. We need to elaborate the operations. Okay. So initially, uh, we have um, simply identified the operations that a class should perform and the rest of its responsibilities. In further iterations, uh, we elaborate on each operation um, of provi uh, in providing details such as for this example. So we can further detail that compute page, compute paper cost takes in um, paper weight, size, color as our parameters, right? Again, the compute um, compute paper cost operation here. The compute paper cost operation here has a uh, ha uh, has parameters like the weight, the size, and also the color. Also, we have a numeric return. By the way, um, this actually the compute paper cost it returns the cost in pesos. That's why I used a numeric return value okay so in every case by the way class the operation should be characterized in a way that ensures high cohesion okay that is the operation should perform a single targeted function or subfunction okay so here in step B again we elaborated the uh, we elaborated the operations. So again, if we will go back to the step three, uh, let's go back. Okay, so in step three, uh, actually we are elaborating the classes and we need to consider these um, things. So cohesion and also the coupling. Also here in step 3a, actually we specify um, the message details i know that you're done with this one because we can incorporate your sequence diagrams here okay next in 3b uh, we identify the interfaces we elaborated the interfaces here here like that one uh, in step uh, 3c we elaborated the uh, we elaborated the um, the attributes and also i uh, also define the data types and data structure for each and for the 3d we elaborated the um, the operations okay so oh actually we're still in 3d i'm so sorry uh, in continuation with what i discussed here um, if it's still not enough uh, for the software engineers um, to understand how the operation should proceed, um, then we can end with uh, we can end with that detail. However, if there are some arcane logic that we need to specify or it's still not yet enough, then we can further elaborate the operation in more detail by um, using a pseudocode, a flowchart, or an activity diagram. So based on this example, again, we are actually elaborating the, um, the compute paper cost operation here that has parameters, um, weight, size, color, and numeric as the return value. Um, you can see here an activity diagram, right? Here. There you go. Okay, so we're done with step three. Step number four, this time we need to um, describe the persistent data sources um, like our databases and also the files and identify the classes required to manage them. This is actually the control classes, guys. Okay, this is actually the control classes. Okay, 
Since we are done elaborating the data structures from the previous uh, from the previous steps, this part we will elaborate the structure and the organization of these persistent data sources. By the word itself, we are actually elaborating our databases. Okay, I know that you have a good background with database, so this is quite easy for you. Okay. So step number five, uh, we need to develop and elaborate a behavioral representation for a class or a component, okay? This is actually still an elaboration. However, we will focus on the behavioral, uh, on the behavior uh, presentation of the class. I believe we're done with, uh, with, this, uh, with this one because you were able to create your state diagrams. I know that this is quite easy for you na lang. Okay, so during the component level design, it is necessary um, to model the behavior of a design class. Uh, we had previously created um, state diagrams as part of our modeling of the system. Um, during the design, we revisit and uh, we revis uh, revisit that and elaborate to include other details that might have come up and clarified along the way. Again, we are doing it iteratively, so there are some um, there are some classes or there are some states that needs to be uh, that will be defined here. Okay, that will be included. So we'll be using again an OCL syntax or the object constraint language syntax. So if you can see it here, we are, uh, we have the event name, okay, which has a parameter list. We also have a guard condition. I know that you, uh, you know this already, and the action expression, okay. Let's have a recap on the state diagram before I will explain that one, okay. So um, the dynamic behavior of, of an object, it is actually an instantiation of a design class as the program executes is actually um, is affected by events that are external to it and the current state which is the mode of behavior of the object okay to understand the dynamic behavior of an object we examine all use cases that are relevant to the design class throughout its life okay so these use cases provide information that helps you to separate the events that affect the object and the states in which the object resides as time passes and events occur. So the transitions between states, uh, I know that the transition between states are what called events, is represented using a state diagram. So the transition from one state represented by a rectangle here, okay, or a, ra a, ra a rounded rectangle, um, to another uh, to another occurs as a consequence from an event that takes the form. So where the event name here, where the event name identifies the event, okay. So for example, here we have um, data input completed. That's the event name. Right, the parameter list. I don't have a parameter list here. Yeah, I don't have a parameter list. Okay, the parameter list, by the way, um, it incorporates the data that are associated with the event. We also have the guard condition. In the guard condition, I will use this one. Okay, the guard condition here. Is written in object orient uh, sorry object constraint language syntax and specifies a condition that must be met before the event can occur. So before, for example, before the computing job cost will perform will be performed. Um, uh, sorry, before the forming job will be for will be performed. Uh, there should be a condition that will be satisfied in the event before it will be performed in the forming job. Okay, so just like for this example, 
um, job cost accepted if the customer is authorized. If it's not authorized, it will not perform this get electronic signature. So it will not continue to the forming job. Okay? There should be a card here. Customer is authorized. Okay, next. Uh -huh. One moment. Mm -hmm. We also have an additional indicators here. We have entry, we have exit, we have do, and we have include. I know that I'm done, uh, we are done um, discussing about the do. I keep on informing you guys to include do since that's actually the action or that should be the operation to be performed inside the state. Okay, so let's talk about entry and exit actions. Okay, so entry and exit actions, it actually occurs, uh, sorry, it actually occur as transition into the state occurs and as transition out of the state occurs. So based on this example, the second state, which is the computing job cost, okay, the entry, um, the entry action will be performed the compute job. The exit is the total job cost. And the total job cost, um, once it will be exited to the state, it will also save, it will also save it. Okay? And there should be a data that will be saved here in this type, uh, in this state. Okay, next. We have the do operate, uh, sorry, do indicator. It provides the mechanism for um, um, indicating activities that occur while in the state. Just like what I keep on explaining, okay, before. Mm -hmm. Next, we also have the include indicator. The include indicator, um, it provides a means for elaborating the behavior by embedding more state diagram detail within the definition of a state so if we if you can see and include based on this example we included the data input this data input has its own state diagram if you can see it here this is the behavior of the state mm -hmm. so there are some um there are some events that needs to be elaborated or that needs to use the include state i oh, sorry needs to use the include an indicator so that it will be more uh it will be more elaborated just like this one okay we're actually on our last slide here we go so step number six we need to elaborate the deployment diagrams to provide additional implementation detail. Uh, we will skip this one because we will discuss this on our next semester, on the next semester. Okay. But again, um, basically, uh, we this part uh, we will specify or uh, there should be a specific hardware and operating system environments that will be used. Um, um, uh, that will be used is specified and the location of the component packages within the environment is indicated. Okay. We will talk more about that one in our next semester. And lastly, we have step seven. We will refactor every component level design representation. Um, the first component level model you create will not be as complete, consistent, and accurate as the as the nth iteration you apply to the model. It is essential to refactor as design work is conducted. Again, we are iter uh, we are actually iterative. So um, expect that there will be more um, revisions that will um, a long way before um, before the deployment part will be implemented okay